We're about kids, we really are. And we're about making sure that athletics uh, is, is something that enhances their educational experience. And off DeLuigi, touchdown! California has separated itself from everybody else in the country as far as developing youth and high school athletics. Struck and in, to one! Sport is an opportunity to teach those skills about how important it is to try to win, and yet, if you don't win, you can thank your opponent for being the one to point out your shortcomings. And the match is over, ladies and gentlemen. Competing in the same arena with people that you don't know really gives you a sense of what life is all about. On Friday nights, you know, everybody's watching you. All your hard work, everything you've worked for during the summer, the grind that you've put in, and then you just go out there and have fun. The 15 touchdown! You always give it your very best every single time because that's what it takes to be great. Any kid in high school can dream about competing at the CIF level. Altman goes to Vanderweide, crushes it down the line. Those CIF experiences were some of the best of my life. It's a great outlet when you're playing on the court. Nothing else matters. Merriweather over top and into the back of the net. I've never seen lines and lines as I saw at the Home Depot Center for that. St. John Bosco will be the champions of the state of California. It was one of the biggest upsets in, in state basketball history. There's Lynn. Oh, there's that quick first step that they talked about. He dunked and he was done. I had to Jason the kid. Oh, yeah. Some of the best memories I have is being a Sacramento High School Dragon and to be a part of CIF. The history of the California Interscholastic Federation is reflected in every student athlete who has laced on running shoes at dawn, taken that last second shot, reached for the extra yard. Their legacy lives in the rules and structure that govern high school athletics, with success measured by the competitions and opportunities that support education-based athletics, the CIF has had a remarkable first 100 years. In 1914, the mission was really try to put all high school sports under one umbrella across the state. It wasn't under an educational model. The rules were different. It was all over the place. And school people, school leaders, principals at that time, superintendents said, we need to see if we can make this under education. They did lay out a whole constitution at one time. Rules were developed as problems came along or anything else, you know, whether it be uh, the age rule or whether it be the amateur rule or whether it be outside competition and things like that as problems were developed that the rules were developed. The job is to kind of create some organization to make it all work. It does give people a chance to to compete in what they want to do and what they love to do and it gives teams and schools a chance to win championships at a higher level and their role is changing just like the role of coaches and parents and kids are changing. I think that the CIF teaches sport as a means of growing character. Young men and women who are ready to find and take their place in society because they've learned the building blocks of a healthy adult life. High school athletics is a tool, it's a, it's a, it's a laboratory, it's a place where uh, students will go out and uh, test their character, test their leadership skill, learn how to work together to achieve a common goal. The concept of abiding by the rules following your coach's instructions, following authority, leading uh, the rest of your team. You know, without the athletic program, without the dramatics, without the clubs and organizations, uh, we, it's not a complete education. I think CIF understands it, that it's not just about winning, but it's about building a better future. The track and field championships are California's longest running state competition, producing many of our country's top professional athletes and Olympians. When we look at the history of the milestones, I, the very first one had to be the state track and field championships that, that took place in the spring of 1915 in Fresno, California. I mean, that was the beginning of, of state championships and kids participating on a statewide level. We've got the greatest track and field athletes in the nation, and we have since the early part of the uh, 20th century. You know, the, uh, you take a look at the Olympic athletes and everything that have come out of California and the national records of coming to California. We've got the population, we've got the weather, uh, we've got the coaching, we've got the emphasis, so 
Mountain California State Track Meet is an outstanding event, not just in the high school scene, but throughout the United States is recognized as, as the pre, a premier activity and it continues to be so. When you look at the history books and the people that talked about it back then, that same excitement occurs today. You're bringing students from all over the state that have these wide and diverse backgrounds, and you bring them to one location to participate and compete against each other. You know, that's always one of the most exciting parts of milestones for the organization are our state championships, and those have continued to grow over the years. Another sport to rise to prominence early in the CIF was football. No community embraced the game quite like Bakersfield, California. Between 1919 and 1927, the Bakersfield football team won six state titles in seven appearances. There's parts of our state that still truly believe in their local school, their local community, and playing for the pride of my school. In Bakersfield, Bakersfield High are the drillers. They're still the drillers, they'll always be, and students who've graduated from there talk about it with great pride. Well, football to Bakersfield is very important. It's a big tradition, and we've had a lot of great stars there. And I went to Bakersfield High, and once a driller, always a driller. It didn't matter if you went to that school, everybody knows that. And uh, we have a long tradition there, so when you walk on that field, it's not just you walking on the field. It's the cleats that have run before you. It's the expectations. So you have to play a little harder. Beginning in, from 1916 through the end of the series in the late 20s, it was one of the teams that was always had to be reckoned with when you were playing for a state football championship. And everyone matters. I by far was not the best player, but everybody made a difference by being part of the team and how much better we were when everybody was in sync. There was a 76 year break of games before we came back. And in 2006, the state bowl games by a vote of our 1,500 member schools, we we're gonna have it again. Bakersfield High School was still right there in the forefront and in the running for an opportunity to get to the bowl championship. Four throws intercepted, this one's gonna be hit six. And going the other way is Kevin Hayes, and this is gonna put 55 on the board for Bakersfield. Bakersfield High School has had a long tradition of outstanding teams, outstanding coaches and players, and continues today. In addition to championships, competition and rivalry propel sports forward. And in California, the oldest rivalry is as fierce today as it was when it began in 1893. Sacred Heart Cathedral and uh, St. Ignatius are two schools in San Francisco, and they've been playing football uh, since 1893. It's the longest running uh, rivalry west of the Mississippi. It's not just the football part of it, but, but when they play the first basketball game at USF, that place is just packed. There's 5,000 people there, and it's just, it's just rocking and rolling. So it's a great rivalry, and it goes back you know, so many years, but it's not just the rivalry they have in, in football, but it's really a great rivalry in all sports. You know, the moms, uh, dads, and their parents, and the parents before them all played in the games, and so um, families follow it, and it's important, and they all go to the games. It unites them, actually, even though they want to beat their brains out afterwards. We didn't quite have the expansive opportunities and sports that the kids have now, so it focused on the, the three major sports, uh, basketball, football, and baseball. So it's a football game, the first basketball game, and then the first baseball game. And whoever wins two out of three uh, has the right to hold the trophy for a year. Since 1947, the two schools have fought for the Bruce Mahoney Trophy, named after St. Ignatius graduate Bill Bruce and Sacred Heart's Jerry Mahoney, both of whom lost their lives in World War II. Mahoney and I graduated in 1944. By this time, I was playing for SI. Mahoney got killed rather tragically right as soon as he graduated as did uh, Bruce, who was a 1938 graduate of SI, and he got killed. And somebody had a good idea, well, let's do something to commemorate this, the memory of these two guys. So it became important right away to win that Bruce Mahoney trophy. The two schools uh, knew a lot of men were coming back from the service and knew the great sacrifice that they made and wanted to honor uh, that sacrifice of uh, Bill Bruce and Jerry Mahoney, uh, representing the sacrifice of uh, all the men and women who did so much to uh, make it through that uh, war. 
It gives you some meaning to your program. Because uh, we didn't have anything, you know, we'd play and you win and lose and the season's over. But now, you got to win that Bruce Mahoney or else you didn't have a good year. You know, it's just a wonderful thing and it's a great opportunity for young people to be able to participate in, in a game of such magnitude, you know. Not too many high school kids get to do that. You know, you might do it in the CIF state championship, but to know that every year you're going to have an opportunity to play in front of a, a packed house or in front of 8,000 people, you know. Not too many uh, high school athletes get that opportunity and I know the kids look forward to it. More on the effects of World War II on student athletics when we continue. With the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor, the United States was drawn quickly into war. Many top high school athletes joined the armed services while efforts to conserve wartime materials like tires and gas led to the suspension of CIF tournaments and meets that required travel. As the guys approached their senior year though, a lot of guys became draft eligible and they were gone. In fact, a lot of the schools get an early graduation where you could graduate in January of your senior year. A lot of guys took advantage of that, but it played hell with a basketball team in the middle of the season, half of them graduated. I was a junior in 1943, October 43, I enlisted in the Navy and actually went into uh, active duty on, uh, I guess it was the last week of May of 44. Former Napa City Mayor Ed Barwick remembers his high school playing days well. Memories from more than 70 years ago still resonate. Oh, I remember catching my first touchdown pass in the, in the first game of the season, yeah. I remember how but my cousin had said, now remember, at any time you run towards the sideline, you know, get your back in front of that guy so he can't get a hand and knock that ball down. And I remember catching it like that, you know, right in front of him and then falling in the end zone. That's one play I can remember. Yeah, but, you know, and I remember in blocking uh, when the guard would block the fellow low and then I came and hit him high and he fell over the guard and then we had the hole open for the runner. And I still relate to that one. The thing about football, it was a team sport. Whatever you did with the team, you, you, you knew what the other fellow was doing, you knew, and if you could help him, you did that. And, and those that were ahead of you and, and were better than you would tell you how you could improve. It was, you know, they worked for it. They, it was just the way people were. We had all these troops and nothing to do, really, you know, pulling guard duty. So uh, it was important that they keep those guys busy, and sports was a big answer. And when you get 15,000 men to pick from in a division, you get a pretty good team. It was interesting to me how that generation who fought World War II transmitted this to the type of leadership we had after World War II. They've been through hell through World War II and they came back with their education. These guys were tough. These guys had seen it all. And, you know, their idea of stress and my idea of stress, where I learned an awful lot from them and their ability to make decisions. They had had to make decisions. They had had to be under stress. It was the old diet, let's get it done, and let's find someone who can get it done, and let's move on. It was really an education for a young commissioner like me. Few servicemen are better remembered than Torrance, California high school athlete and Olympian, Louis Zamperini. In 1934, at the preliminary meet of the California State Championships, Zamperini set a world interscholastic record for the mile clocking in at an amazing 4 minutes, 21.2 seconds. The following week, he won the CIF State Meet Championships with a time of 4 minutes, 27.8 seconds. Louis Zamperini did not start running competitively until high school. Louis was a juvenile delinquent. By his own description, he'd say, I was a rascal, I was a scoundrel, I was a bad guy. And he was a smoker and a drinker and he was a carouser. In fact. He says he used to hear the police yell, stop, Louie, stop. And then he took up track and he heard his schoolmates yell, go, Louie, go. And he said the difference in that tone changed the way I looked at myself. All of a sudden, I was proud of what I was doing. I wasn't embarrassed about it. And I wanted to do it well. He learned to push himself, to excel, that no matter what someone said you couldn't do it, he could, he would, he, he wouldn't stop. That captures the heart of what we hope high school sports presents for every student. 
This was 10 years before Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile. I personally spoke with Jim Ryan, the miler, and Don Bowden, the first American to break the four minute mile, and both of them said, if Louie can run the last lap of a 5,000 meters in 56 seconds, clearly he should have been the guy to break the four minute mile. And he would have done so had it not been for the fact that the Olympics where he was ready to do it were canceled because of the war. Louis gave up his running career to serve his country in the Air Corps, and we'll just have to imagine what it would have been like for him to break the four minute mile because everybody knows he would have done it. Now the subject of a major motion picture, Zamperini was lost at sea for 47 days and imprisoned in a Japanese prisoner of war camp for nearly a year. The Louis Zamperini story is because it's two stories in one. It's not just the the whole you know rise from rags to riches and going to the Olympics in 1936, but it's also the other story of after you know when he when he is shot down in the Pacific and the survival story and, and all that and just the amount of you know, torture he had to endure. So it's really you know, two great stories in one life. He will say that his athletic experiences helped better prepare him for the war experience than many of his other soldiers and, and uh, uh, platoon mates. It's a team effort. Even in track and field, it's an individual effort. You still need that person next to you training you, pushing you. You have to connect and count on the person next to you. In our world, it's a win or a loss. In the armed forces, it's life and death. So we hope that we're, High school sports plays a little bit of part on learning that you are a team. You have to connect with the person next to you and you have to rely on the person next to you if we're going to both be successful here. He said that when they were offering um, uh, sea rescue lessons and what to do in case you're surrounded by sharks in the ocean, he said he attended those classes because athletes know you want to learn about what's necessary. 25,000 soldiers on Hawaii, 12 kids show up to take the class and it's the lessons he learned in the class that saved his life on the Pacific Ocean. When you talk about perseverance and grit, how often has he had to persevere in a race where he feels like I'm out of energy and I can't go anymore, but then he has to find that last kick. You know, you do the same thing in that situation. You gotta find your last kick when you're in the middle of the ocean, uh, knowing that, you know, there's a chance you're gonna die out here. Where are you gonna reach? Where are you gonna dig to find that last kick? And that, to me, that's what it symbolizes. Every leader has always said intrinsically there's these great joys that high school sports that you can teach through education-based athletics that I'm not going to get in the classroom. If just a part of what we saw there was taught to him and embedded through his participation in sports, then those coaches and teachers back in his day were very successful. And we hope our coaches and teachers today are the same. I can't improve on that movie or what everybody else has said about it except to say that I think we're all proud that he was a CIF athlete. When we return, female athletes achieve greater opportunity with the passage of Title IX. Heroes are those who go to extreme measures to change our world for the better. In the last 100 years, CIF has had more than its share of role models, inspirations, and record setters. In the 1960s, there was a movement across the United States challenging the lack of opportunities available to female athletes. Once again, CIF was at the forefront, establishing interscholastic sports for girls. It started in California before Title IX. In 1955, Beverly Hills High School started offering girls swimming and girls tennis, and were competing against other schools. That opened the door. When Title IX became law in 1972, 1968, they'd done a survey. We had over 35,000 young girls in high school sports playing in California already, it, it, four years ahead of that. Title IX changed high school sports unlike any other rule or law ever. I mean, it gave girls the opportunity to compete at a high level, and it's, it's the impact has been truly amazing. The amount of scholarships that girls receive now uh, is sometimes surpasses boys in, in certain sports. It added a whole new exciting dimension to literally one half of our student population. To see the, the boys at the stands cheering the girls when they played basketball, not just vice versa, it was a positive thing. 
title time, women's athletics, one of the greatest things that uh, happened to the CIF and I think uh, this whole country. Title IX changed everything, stimulating growth in programs already in place and motivating schools without them to begin supporting female athletes. When you think of women's sports, uh, I think California is not just the national leader, but it's le really the leader in the entire world for women's sports. There's been a lot of people who have who've, who've trailblazed, Billie Jean King being the first one that comes to mind, but there's a lot of trailblazers such as her that have really you know, led the way in women's sports. And that's, that's every women's sport you can imagine, from swimming to softball, volleyball. There's all-time great athletes from California in all of them. What's been a great joy uh, over the last 30 years of my career is to watch the growth of, of women athletics in, in the state. A graduate of our school, Vinnie Cotrero, is, was a trailblazer in that. And uh, Sacred Heart Cathedral uh, Women's Athletic Program has, has clearly uh, won more championships, have done more things than the men, uh, and we're very proud of, uh, of the opportunity that's been provided uh, the young girls uh, through the development of women athletics and you know to go out and watch uh, a lacrosse game or a basketball game and just see just the speed and the, the talent of the women it, it's just so uh, uplifting to know that they're being provided the same opportunity that the men were uh, provided uh, years ago. By Vander Weide. she rolls it in so Redondo's going to get a swing for the game here's Bustamante on the slide and she got it! I became involved with the CIF when um, Title IX came on on the platform and what happened was Congress put out an amendment that said you, you could not keep anybody from participating in sports on the basis of sex. Commissioner in San Francisco called me and asked me if I would serve. Go down with him to the CIF, I knew nothing about it, I said what is this CIF? And he said, uh, well, it's for the girls, this new Title IX thing, you know, the boys are going to have to give up stuff and let you girls play. I said, well, it's about time. Native San Franciscan Vincentine Contrero is a retired educator and a longtime advocate for women and girls. She was the first female executive board member and the first member at CIF to have voting privileges. We got involved with state meets. It really opened the horizon for the women because they had never, never had a state meet and know anything about it. But... Uh, it, it, it just helped us to broaden the horizons and then the students got better, better skilled. The more they played, the harder they, they went at it and the, the better they did. So it, stand, it stood to help women in a lot of ways. Title IX was hugely important um, for girls and young women. And it was not only about making sports equal opportunity, but all kinds of resources. Before, even when girls went to university and so forth, I mean, you could only study certain kinds of things, right? After Title IX, you could do anything. You could become anything. A tennis and track athlete in high school, Dr. Cynthia Brazil recognizes the opportunities Title IX introduced to student athletes. For me, you know, I'm at MIT. I do robotics and artificial intelligence. That career opportunity wasn't really open to women before Title IX. So, um, huge importance, I think, not only for sports, and I think you know, whether you grew up to be a professional athlete um, or whether you just learn a lot of life lessons through sports, like I did, that carries through the rest of your life. I was in this amazing lab, which was the first lab developing what's called autonomous robots. So when you think of robots like R2-D2 and C-3PO that think by themselves, interact with people, it was the very beginning of that. But I remember that moment because it was like my childhood memories of Star Wars kind of came flooding back where I thought, if we're ever going to see robots like R2-D2 or C-3PO, um, it's going to happen in a lab like this. In fact, it might happen exactly in this lab. So I knew that's really where I wanted to be. That's when I really started developing my career in um, what's now called the field of social robotics, which I basically founded and pioneered um, from my graduate work at MIT. She's the perfect example of what we hope high school sports is about for the kids who don't go on. She played high school sports, but she went on and is now at the top of her career. In my professional life, um, founding a company, working with my graduate students at MIT, teamwork is huge. You know, how you are there for other people, how you can ask for help when you need it, 
um, how you can work independently um, and still, again, be part of that team. These are all really critical skills. In track, I was a sprinter, short distance sprinter. And one of the key tools, you know, techniques you use to become a sprinter is you do wind sprints. And I hated wind sprints with a passion. But you do them because that's what it takes to be successful and to do well and you know, ultimately basically to win, you do them. And I think not only do you do them, you always give it your all. You, know, you always give it your very best. You always put yourself out there every single time because that's what it takes to be great. Even if you hate it, even if it's painful. You know, and again, I think in life, no matter what you wanna do, if there's something bold and ambitious that you're striving for, there's gonna be parts of that that are wonderful and exciting. There's gonna be parts of that that are just awful. <laughs> you don't wanna to have to do it, they're not fun. But you know you have to do them and you have to do them to the best of your ability and you have to give it your all. And I think a lot of success in life is learning that and having that attitude. And I learned that very young in life through sports. Coming up, a state title in basketball opens doors for a future LA Laker when we continue. Athletic success can be defined in many ways. No state has more players in the NFL, NBA, or Major League Baseball than California. Nor has any state won as many gold medals in the Olympics. LA Laker Jeremy Lin is the rare example of an athlete who has made it to the top of his game. He made every play at the end of every game to get all the way to the state finals. And when they got to the state finals, they played modern day of Santa Ana. Palo Alto High School was a heavy underdog. Um, Everybody thought modern day is going to just romp to this. And it, halfway through the first quarter, everyone in the arena that knew anything about basketball goes, oh, we got a ball game here. There's Lynn. Needs something good and he finally got it. But the game was tight and close the whole way. It was just one of those, it's one of those goosebump moments and chilling moments because as you're watching it, you're just thrilled at the performance of the game. There's Lynn. Oh, there's that quick first step that they talked about. Palo Alto on a 9-2 run, and that's over. That kid can stroke the triple. Yeah, everybody on paper would say the size, the athleticism, the quickness is with the Monarchs. But it's the heart that is with the Vikings, and their heart has been on display so far tonight. As it's getting into the middle of the fourth quarter, you go, I'm watching something very special here tonight. It was one of the biggest upsets in, in state basketball history. Um, Palo Alto beating modern day, that's for sure. Four seconds on the shot clock, and Lynn is going to have to launch a 25-footer. And it in! Did he call that? I don't think he called that. It happened. No one gave them a prayer. You know, I think there are two moments in my life when, you know, I came close to crying tears of joy. You know, all the other ones have been tears of sorrow. One was after winning the state championship game. It's the best feeling to go out on top. I mean, it's, it's, it is a dream come true. And the other one was uh, when I had my breakout game for the Knicks um, because I was able to, you know, I thought I was going to get cut, and after that I knew they couldn't cut me. He had some good folks surrounding him and, and encouraging him and pushing him. But imagine if you, if you accepted the one person that may have said, ah, you're not going to be able to do that. You know, like him not being highly recruited. Imagine if he accepted that. I would bet that that's why he's where he is. He's at. He believes in himself, um, and he didn't allow folks to kind of deter him from that from that path. You know, I would say to an athlete who's kind of you know unsure about whether to play or not. You know, it's all about finding your passion. Like, do you really love the game? If you love the game and you want to get better, and it means a lot to be a part of the team, it means a lot to be playing that sport. I would say go for it. You know, you're only young once. You're only in high school for four years. And, uh, you know, you got to take advantage, you know, once, once you get out, you may never play sports again. Um, hopefully you do, and, um, but just to go for it, you know, that's the biggest thing my parents always encouraged me is just go for it. They saw how much I love basketball, so they said play as long as you can. I never thought I was going to play in high school, I never thought I was going to play in college, and I definitely didn't think I would, I'd be in the NBA today. The other 98% of the kids that don't go on to professional sports, we're trying to teach them the same skill. You can be the best you can be, keep growing. You know, he finally just 
relaxed, I think, and didn't worry about making mistakes in the NBA and just said, it's my last game, I'm just gonna go for it. And when he did that, Lynn Sanity happened. It's been an unbelievable journey, you know, um, starting off playing high school in California, going east, doing the whole circuit, coming back to Golden State, getting waived, Houston, New York, Houston, back to LA, um, where I was born. You know, I'm just excited to be back in California. Um, everyone who knows me knows I'm, I'm, I'm a California boy to the core. Former student athletes carry the lessons they learned from sports into every facet of their lives. Beverly Hills High School principal Carter Paysinger has been a pioneer in education reform, beginning with his own story. I was uh, a student here on a multicultural permit, and uh, so I lived in South Central Los Angeles and was going to school in Beverly Hills. And uh, looking back on it now, it was a pretty crazy experience. My mom uh, was really a strong-willed woman, and, and education was the priority for her kids. And, and uh, me being the oldest, uh, my mom wanted to make sure that, that she provided the best opportunity for me. Uh, she found out about the multicultural permit program to get into Beverly Hills High School, and, and she went full force to uh, realize that program for us. For me, it was the ability to be with other people, and then moving in here, finding your niche is important. Uh, not only for, for you academically, but for you socially. And, and, uh, and I found that niche in, through athletics. Paysinger excelled at all sports while attending Beverly Hills High School. After college, he was hired by the school to be a teacher and coach, later moving on to athletic director and then principal. The skills that I learned are the skills that I try to instill uh, as a football coach and an athletic director, and even now as the principal. Uh, all of those life skills that, that our young people are going to need to be successful in life from, from uh, time management and discipline and responsibility. All of the things that, that you're going to need to be successful. We want to build character in our kids uh, where they can handle difficult situations. They can, they can build some resiliency in that experience. They can build some grit uh, as they move through their lives and, and handle some of the tough decisions and tough things they're going to have to handle. You're competing to get into college, you're competing to do well in, 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 in college, uh, you're competing for new jobs, and understanding how to compete, how, how to uh, balance your life, uh, are all things that you learn in athletics. You've got a lot of different stories within the history of CIF. Um, right now you're seeing one with Carter Pacinger, but I could tell my story too. I could tell my story living in the projects um, and not having that father in the home. How many other athletes can tell that story? just overcoming adversity, you know, kids that have been diagnosed with serious diseases that have been able to come back from that and able to participate um, and, and, and have normal athletic, you know, experiences. So there's a lot of stories within CIF that we'll never capture, but we know that these other ones that get recognized, they're actually representative of, of, of I think, a lot of experiences that uh, a lot of the student athletes go through. Every coach has his or her own formula for success but few can rival the achievements of De La Salle's legendary Bob Lattiser, an educator who believes heart and soul in the potential of every student athlete. De La Salle football is an anomaly, really not just in California, but there's nothing like it in the entire history of high school sports in the nation. You, know, you just have to start basically with the architect or the coach, his name is Bob Lattiser, and he took over a program that had never had a winning season. We didn't have a weight room, we didn't have any weights, we didn't have stadium lights, anything. And so there was a lot of room for growth and I had a lot of good help and once we had a couple winning seasons, the parents kind of got on board and, and really liked what we were doing and it just took off from there. William straight back, steps up, airs it on deep, he's got a man, it's Morris, Morris has it, touchdown Minnesota! You know, the basis of it is you play for the guy next to you. And I mean, this team won 151 games in a row. They went 12 seasons without losing a high school football game. And they played all the best teams. And they didn't just win, they won by an average score of 42 to 8. Those coaches all work well together and they always have the bigger goal in mind of educating the kids and the winning and the titles and the win streaks. To them, it's just all a byproduct of what they do every day. Dan LaSalle doesn't go away. It's the best high school football program ever. We don't differentiate between teacher-coach. 
we see it as one and the same. You know, we want the same thing coming out from both activities. So, you know, there's a lot of things you teach in team sport that you can't get in the classroom. You know, first of all, kids are more enthusiastic about being there in the extracurricular activity. And uh, you get the opportunity to bring them together as a team, learn how to work with each other, uh, be accountable for each other. That means being on time. That means working hard in practice. It's not about collecting wins or trophies or anything like that. It's learning where to play a part, how to be a part of a, of a real working team. What we feel was they created an authentic team experience where they sacrificed them for their, their own individual glory and selves for the good of the team. With a final coaching record of 399, 25 and 3, Vladisir Spartans hold the California record for wins and winning percentage. He continues as an assistant coach, maintaining the high standards of education-based athletics he instituted when he began. I'm proud of what uh, we've done here at De La Salle. I'm proud of being one of the, I think, top schools in California. And I'm proud of our reputation, not our school, but our reputation as a state throughout the union and what we do here as in an athletic uh, tradition. It's, it's really phenomenal. You know, as you get older, like my age, you may not remember every high school teacher, every college professor you had, but you always remember the people that coach you. Kids, especially at that age, are so uh, impressionable and, and they're so easily influenced, you know, especially in the middle school, high school age, because you're trying to figure out what's cool, what's not cool, what's okay, what's not okay. And so having a mentor or a role model or, or you know, in some cases even a father figure um, is really important. I think a good coach who has to be a bit psychologist, has to be a lot of cheerleader, has to be a master technician, and should be a historian of the sport as well. All of these combine together to provide me with the skills I needed to be successful. It, it's hard to weigh it, but many athletes I know have the reverence for their coach that they have for their father. And I'm the same. I love the coaches who affected my life. I love them like they were my dad. What makes a great coach is somebody who's passionate about his sport or her sport, someone who's dedicated. Their ability to get the most out of their kids and to make them want to achieve greatness, and not just necessarily on, on, on the field or court, but greatness when they go off to college, when they become professionals and whatever they choose to do. We want to see them with that drive and that's where they think we're a great coach can really you know, make a huge difference. Final reflections on the CIF's achievements when we continue. This past school year, we had the most students participating in the history of the state of California playing high school sports. That old saying, if you build it, they'll come, it's true about high school sports and our schools continue to build it so the kids are coming. Without sports, I don't think I'd be myself. You know, I have sports to thank for everything. That, you know, without sports, I wouldn't be able to, to go off and uh, do great things. You gotta like keep pushing yourself and don't feel like things are gonna be too good. So I think being an athlete has shaped me a lot. I know for sure I'd be a, a different person um, because I've learned so many things, even on uh, the same level as the thing I've, things I've learned in the classroom, um, just kind of the principles that we've built our team on. Being an athlete is basically everything I am. Like, I have no idea where I'd be without it. Um, it shapes my character, it shapes where I am, it shapes where I'm going to go. If I didn't have sports, it'd just kind of be like a blank space in my life. I just like pushing myself every day and uh, seeing what I can achieve. The adrenaline rush you get while you're playing, and it's a great outlet you have, when you're playing on the court, that else matters. Without sports, I think I would be really stressed out, and just being able to go and play kind of relieves me, and I don't have to think about that. It lets me get away, it lets me do what I love. I have passions for both of the sports I do, so when I'm out there, it's like nothing else matters. And it lets me be who I am, and I forget about everything else. I've learned the lessons of like resilience, you know, to get back up and when you fall down and learn the lesson that failure isn't everything. That you definitely, being an athlete, you have to deal with failure. Playing basketball led into my academics as well because I know I have to be, you have to be just as disciplined on the court as you do in the classroom. Always stay competitive and don't 
live on your mistakes. Just move on and be the best you can be. You definitely create a lot of bonds while playing the sport, like a lot more friendships and relationships throughout, and it it's definitely um, gives you life learning lessons when you're playing. Since 1914, the CIF has overseen high school athletics, promoting equity, quality, character, and academic development. Their vision of pursuing victory with honor continues to reverberate across the state with no sign of slowing down. And that uh, motto has, has continued all the way through up to this present day, 100 years, that uh, athletics are great, they're great for our young people, they're great for what we're trying to do, but they've got to be controlled. The emphasis always has been on the control and education of our young people. We're not going to have the tail wagging the dog. And uh, that's because educators and boards of education and, and are in control of the CIF. And uh, I think that's been uh, a hallmark and has been a great strength and continues to be. It tied the whole thing together. It gave some stability, some meaning to all the records. And as they get more sophisticated in their playoff structures, it became even better. I think it's done a lot for high school sports. And I think our most recent uh, milestones is we're looking at how, with the change and advancements of medical science about sports, what are we doing to help injuries, prevent injuries, minimize risk for our student athletes that are participating. We have more kids than ever playing in sports, and we think it's safer today than it's ever been, but we have to continue to do more. Wins and losses, they come and go. But the safety of the kids participating, making the games exciting for them, that, that's a huge role that we have to continue to fulfill. The high school athletes who become the doctors and lawyers and soldiers always say the importance of high school sports and how it played the role in, in creating that leadership that they needed to get to the next level. That will do it. The Westview Wolverines turned away a season ago. Hang on for a huge 2-1 victory. And they are Division I girls champions. There's certain things when you grow up that are very foundational and you know, dribbling on basketball and playing sports and being a part of CIF, it just brings a community together. And I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to Cal Berkeley, so I went to Cal and when I was at Cal, I would go over where the Golden State Warriors used to play and they'd have you know, CIF games and it just brought you back to your roots here in Sacramento. Went on to Phoenix and played for the Phoenix Suns and I knew that no matter where I went and no matter how many NBA cities I traveled to, I knew I always wanted to come back to Sacramento because this was home. I'm proud to give back and I think you know, that's a badge of honor for all of us and I think our young people certainly can embrace and own that. We're continuing to have folks come through the doors in leadership, uh, on committees, with different groups that are really looking out for kids and looking out for the best interests of kids. And in the end, you're still going to have your championship events where certain schools are always there because they're, they've done a good job building their programs. But overall, I, I think we're looking at making sure that all of our student athletes have a positive experience and, and, and are able to take other things away from athletics beyond the championships. It's about high school sports. It's about kids playing for the joy and the love of the game. One thing hasn't changed since 1914 to today. Kids play because it's fun. Sometimes as adults we get lost in the winning and losing. But for the kids and the players out there, that's universal. It hasn't changed in over the 100 years. I hope that doesn't change in the next 100 years.